I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Well, Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. And I'm very anxious. I'll bet I can guess why. You're right. It's what you told me about last week, about the new Walt Disney story. Aha, uh-huh, you didn't forget. No, I should say not, because Walt Disney stories are always wonderful. Yes, you bet they are. And today we're going to begin another story in those wonderful Walt Disney colors, a story called The Sword and the Rose. What's it about? Well, we'll start reading it pretty quick, but I'll give you a hint. It's set in the early days of England, about the year 1514, when King Henry was king of England. Is it about knights? Because it says sword. Yes, it's back in the days when knighthood was in flower, and brave men fought for the hand of beautiful women. I can't wait. Well, then we better get started right away. Yes, please, quick. Read me the funny. Buck the comic weekly. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. (whistles) Toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. (whistles) The boys at the army camp are really fed up with the way the army life is run. They're tired of parades, of having to be on duty all the time, and of not having the kind of fun they'd like to have. And so they've made up a list of protests and suggestions which they intend to hand in to the sergeant. Beetle is writing up the list. His friend Killer says, I bet the sergeant won't even read our list of gripes and suggestions. Beetle speaks up like a hero. We have a right to speak our minds. And Private Zero, who always does whatever Beetle does, makes a long speech agreeing with Beetle. He says, The yeah. Beetle stands up with the completed list of suggestions. There are some very level-headed suggestions here. Third picture, top row. Beetle enters the sergeant's office, ready to shove the list of suggestions under the sergeant's nose. But the place is empty. Oh, darn it. He's not in. Last picture, top row. Beetle lays the sheets of suggestions on the desk. I'll just leave the list here on his clipboard where he'll be sure to find it. being put through their drills. The sergeant is standing aside talking to the captain. Uh, Do you have some orders for today, sir? The captain replies, "Uh, Yes, yes. I left a list on your clipboard. Yes, sir. I'll have them carried out immediately, sir. The sergeant goes into his office. He picks up the sheet of paper attached to his clipboard and starts to read it. No more boys. Let the men... Let the men... Make sure they are served. By this time, the sergeant is practically rolly-eyed. If I didn't have 15 years toward retirement, I'd tear up these orders and go AWOL. Last picture. The captain hears music and the sound of a party. He looks across the parade ground and sees something he's never seen in the army. His soldiers are having a picnic. Our guns are dumped in the ash can. Beetle is lying on the ground, and over him stands a beautiful blonde dropping grapes in his mouth. Zero and Killer are being served ice cream sodas by another beautiful blonde. And the sergeant is tied to a post, his shirt ripped off. And one of the soldiers stands behind him with a long whip, ready to give the sergeant ten lashes on the bare back. The captain exclaims, Well... What's going on here? And the sergeant exclaims, You mean these aren't your orders, sir? No, no, no. But uh, don't stop. Don't stop. 
This is better than what I ordered. Oh, uh, miss, uh, may I have a grape, please? <laughs> Wasn't that funny? <laughs> when the sergeant went to his desk to get the captain's orders, he didn't see them because Beetle had put his suggestions on top of the captain's. <laughs> yeah. Well, the sergeant didn't take the trouble to look at the page underneath, and so he went ahead and carried out all of Beetle's suggestions, thinking he was carrying out the captain's orders. <laughs> To find that the sergeants put them through orders, giving them such a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet they were, too. Oh, that beetle, he's some fellow. Yes, that beetle, he's some fellow. Now we'll start that new Walt Disney story straight from the treasury of classic tales. Turn over the page, go past little iodine and Prince Val, turn over that page, and here on page four is our new story, The Sword and the Rose. From the famous adventure novel, When Knighthood Was in Flower. It's Merry, Merry England, When Knighthood Was in Flower. Music to bewitch our story hour. We're at Windsor Castle in the year 1514, almost 450 years ago. This is the court of King Henry VIII, one of the most famous kings of England. A famous wrestling match is in progress. King Henry has matched his best wrestlers against the champions of France. This was the day when lords and ladies enjoyed sports and when the lords themselves participated in them the way that a schoolboy does today. The Duke of Buckingham, one of King Henry's favorites, is wrestling a Marquis from France. The Duke sticks out his foot. Seizes the wrist of the champion, expertly gives him a flip, and the Frenchman spins over and falls to the ground, defeated. Bravo! Bravo! Well done, my lord! The Duke of Buckingham stands up in triumph over the fallen Frenchman. Last picture, top row, all eyes are on the victorious Duke. All except those of Mary Tudor, sister of the king. Her gaze is centered on the man at the Duke's side. Charles Brandon, gentleman adventurer, just returned from the foreign wars. And now, at her suggestion, Henry issues a command. Oh, Master Brandon, let's see how you would fare against the mighty Buckingham. Brandon looks very surprised to hear the king ask him, an ordinary soldier, to wrestle the famous duke. But Brandon quickly strips down to his tight, then steps into the ring. He approaches the duke, watching him carefully. Suddenly, the duke leaps forward. With a quick blow, shoves his elbow into Brandon's throat. Then he seizes Brandon in an arm lock. Well done, well done! But Brandon slips out of the arm lock, gets the Duke off balance, lifts him on his shoulders, spins him around, and throws him to the ground. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Well done, well executed. As the crowd roars, Brandon bows humbly to the Duke, saying respectfully, May it please your grace. Last picture, King Henry applauds. Well done, fellow. You're a credit to England. And then the King's sister, Mary, says softly to the King... Master Brandon would make a handsome captain of the guards. Uh, yes, yes. And so he shall be. And so Charles Brandon makes an auspicious entry into the court of Henry VIII. Ooh, that's an exciting story. I thought you'd like it. I do. And wasn't that a good idea, the king's sister? Oh, yes, it was. I think that Mary might be falling in love with Brandon. You mean love at first sight? It looks like it could be. Oh, and just because Brandon defeated the famous Duke in the wrestling match, is he going to be captain of the guards? Mm-hmm, he will. And next week we'll probably see that happen. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I just can't wait. Well, neither can I, but we're going to have to. Well, now let's go across the page past the Lone Ranger. Turn over that page, go across page six, and there on page seven is Roy Rogers. Oh, yes. And you remember Roy Rogers had met his old friend Wildwood O'Dowd She's a cowgirl. And J. Lucian Dangerfield, who's the owner of a carnival. And the sheriff had taken charge of the carnival because the railroad payroll had been stolen. And the trail of the crooks led straight to the carnival. Naturally, because one of the crooks who works at the carnival is a man named Mike Cole, and he's one of the crooks. And I'm worried because Roy has suspicions about Mike Cole, and he's going to go into Mike Cole's tent to talk to him. And Mike Cole heard Roy talking to Wildwood through the tent wall. And he's waiting for Roy with a gun. I wonder what will happen. Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. A yip by yo Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo As danger 
Dangerfield wonders what to do about this grave situation. Roy is inside Mike Coe's tent searching for the stolen payroll. Third picture, top row, Coe snorts. Ah, you got a nerve, Rogers, going through my stuff. I've been laid up ever since Nellie the Tiger clawed me. I had nothing to do with stealing that railroad payroll. Well, all right, then. You got nothing to worry about then, Mike. Last picture, top row, Roy suddenly exclaims. "Uh Uh-huh. My hunch paid off. Here's the stolen railroad strong box. Well, that won't prove anything, Rogers. First picture, bottom row, Roy turns to Cole, holding up the empty box. Well, the money's gone, Cole. You transferred it to one of the balloon ballast bags before you got hurt. (coughs) Suddenly, Cole draws his gun from under the bandage that holds his injured arm. All right, drop that box, Rogers. You figured right. But you won't live to squeal on me. Roy swiftly swings the metal box, knocking the gun out of Cole's hand. Now you'll do some squealing, Mike. Oh, blast you. Then quickly, Roy picks up the gun and standing over Cole says, All right, now talk, Cole. Who were the men out on the plane who grabbed the ballast bag with the money when the balloon landed? Lay off, Rogers. Lay off. Uh, I'll spill it. At that moment, outside of the tent, third picture, bottom row, the other two crooks, Ham and Smiley, are standing listening. They've heard everything that's happened. Smiley says, Hey, I reckon we got here just in time, Ham. Last picture, Ham, who is the leader, points to the tiger cage. All right, come on, Smiley. We'll let Nellie the tiger take care of them two in the tent, and it'll look like an accident. Oh, isn't that awful? Just when it looked like Roy was in control of the situation, the other two crooks were coming to Mike Cole's tent to talk to him, and now they've heard everything that went on. Yes, and now they're going to turn the tiger loose, hoping the tiger will kill both Mike Cole and Roy. My, do you think that will happen? Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now let's turn over the page. And here on the last page of the first section is Flash Gordon. Yes, you remember? Flash is starting on a new expedition to a new planet. Yes, the planet Titan, a mysterious place that not very much is known about. That's why they're sending Flash there. And you remember that Flash had told Dale not to come along because it was dangerous. But when the rocket ship was up in the air, he found Dale was hiding on the ship. So Dale is going along now because it's too late to turn back. Yes, and she saw some giant handcuffs. And she's wondering what kind of people they expect to find on the planet. And I've been wondering, too. Well, let's read now and see if we can find out anything about this mysterious planet. Here we go with Flash Gordon. A rig a rig a doon doon saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Dale looks at the equipment on the rocket ship. The pistols, rifles, huge handcuffs. And she wonders what they expect to find on Titan. Flash stammers, we don't know, honey. We've had some rather odd reports, and, well, we want to be prepared. The pilot exclaims, Don't know my eye. Why, we know enough to know we have no room for nosy females. All right, all right, stow it, Midas. Don't tell me to stow it, Gordon. I'll say what I please. Suddenly, the observer exclaims, Titan! Quickly, everybody snaps to their stations. Last picture, top row, the observer points at a large globe in space. Look! Look, there it is. Titan, dead on course. Quickly, flash orders. Man your stations. Get ready to fire number one rocket tube. Stand by. A moment later, they come in for a landing. First picture, bottom row, switches are thrown. Reverse rockets roar. And the huge ship slowly settles. Flash is the first to emerge from the rocket ship. Titan. Just like back on Earth. As Flash starts to clamber down, Midas starts to come down saying, And I shall be the first Earthman to set foot on it. Hold it. Now listen, Gordon, what's up? You just missed my head. Last picture, Flash picks up an insect as large as a 10-pound lobster. Yes, but I didn't miss this. An ant the size of a Gila monster. We'll sleep inside the ship tonight. I'm not sure that I do either. He looks like a troublemaker. Yes, he does. This must be a very strange planet to find ants as big as lobsters. Yeah, and if that's so, I wonder how big the people there are. I wonder, too. Well, maybe we'll find out more about that next week. Now it's time to pick up the second section of the Comic Weekly. Oh, yes, and there's that funny Dagwood. And we'll find out what happens to that funny Dagwood in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. (laughs) 
Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafoo, Ramafum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie says to Dagwood... Dagwood, our ladies' neighborhood club is having a meeting at Mrs. McNuff's house tonight. Really? <laughs> Dagwood says... Oh, boy. All the wives of the meeting and all the husbands home alone. What an opportunity for a game. And by the time you can go, Dagwood's at Herb Woodley's door. Last picture, top row. Game starts at my house right away. Come on, Herb. Fine, I'll be there. And down the street, Dagwood goes from one house to the other. Come on, boys. Game's at my house. To the Jones house. To the Lewis's house. To the Allen's house. To the Snurkle's house. Boy, I feel like Paul Revere gathering the Minutemen. The last picture, second row, he's back home in the kitchen, sawing away at a chunk of meat. This will make me the most popular man in the neighborhood. I'll make up a stack of sandwiches. First picture, third row. Herb and the rest of the men come into the living room. There stands a table with chairs around it and cards and poker chips already out. Fine chairs, boys. Everything's ready for the game. Boy, oh boy. For once we can have a game without being caught by the women. Over at the McNuff house, where all the women are gathered for their meeting, Mrs. McNuff comes downstairs and exclaims, Oh, Blondie, bad news. My little Cynthia has come down with the mumps. Oh, how terrible, Mrs. McNuff. What will we do? Well, uh, could we gather at your house? Why, of course. Just bring all the girls there. First picture, bottom row. At the Bumstead house, the boys are playing poker. I'll bid ten cents. Uh, I'll make it fifteen cents. Suddenly, the door opens. And in walk the women. So sweet of you to invite us, Blondie. The men take one look. Hey, our wives! And out the window they go. Out of my way! Go me first! Look out! Let me out of here! At last picture, they dash down the street, throwing things at Dagwood. He is out front, trying to get away from him. And as the bricks hit Dagwood, he moans, No! Oh, I wish I had Paul Revere's horse now! <laughs> <laughs> Dagwood, look what happened to him. Those men have all turned on him as though it were his fault. Yes, how did he know that Mrs. McNuff's baby would come down with the mumps? Well, I guess the women don't like to have their husbands play cards. No, I guess they don't. They certainly found that out. Yes, they certainly found that out. Well, now let's turn over the page. All right. Oh, look, there's my favorite, favorite, Br'er Rabbit. Yes, Br'er Rabbit. Please read that. I most certainly will. So here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a, a habit, habit to give us music for old Bro Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, Sometimes Bro Rabbit is a bigger goose than Mr. Goose. Today, Bro Rabbit is walking down the road when he hears a voice behind him. Oh, uh, Bro Rabbit, wait up, wait up. I's got a new trick to show you. It's Mr. Goose. Br'er Rabbit stops, and Mr. Goose waddles up. Yep, yep, I just invented a brand new one. Uh, I want to show you first. Well, uh, b -b -b what is it? Now, you promises that you won't tell nobody. Yeah, I, I promises. What's the trick, Mr. Goose? Last picture, top row. Br'er Goose announces solemnly, The flying money trick. Now, has you got a $2 bill? A $2 bill? Yeah. Uh, we sure. Well, um, you give it to me, and I'll show you. Okay, Doko. First picture, bottom row, Brewer Goose takes the $2 bill. Now, the first thing I does is fold the bill so it looks like a butterfly. Oh, I see. And then, and then, and then you're going to make it fly, huh? Second picture, bottom row, Brewer Goose holds it up, saying, Hey, I see. A butterfly. Yeah, but it ain't flying. Brewer Goose says, Well, now, Brewer Rabbit... I is making the money fly. And he leaps in the air and flies off with Br'er Rabbit's money. Hey, wait, 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 you... And last picture, Br'er Rabbit stands on the road watching Br'er Goose disappear in the distance. Uh-oh. I is being outfoxed by a goose. And Uncle Remus says... 
The fool spends a lot of time practicing. Yes, he <laughs> thought that Br'er Goose was going to show him a trick that he could play on other people. <laughs> and instead, the trick was played on Br'er Rabbit. Yep, that was one time Br'er Rabbit got <laughs> fooled. Well, now I'm sure you'd like to see what's happening to Dick in the early days of America. Oh, yes, I would. Very well, then, let's turn to the very last page of the Comic Weekly. And here we are with Dick's adventure. And you remember that Dick is in the early days of America? Yes, the year 1807. And you remember that he and his friend Sarah were going to a party at Robert Livingston's house. And they were riding along the river when all of a sudden they saw a steamboat sending up clouds of smoke and fire. And this is something that no one had ever seen in those days because at that time all of the ships were sailing vessels. And this boat was Robert Fulton's new invention. It was the first steamboat. That's right. And Dick and Sarah hurried down to where the boat had pulled in at the dock. Now, please read. I'd like to find out what happened to All me. right, here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack, a zack, a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. A large crowd has gathered around the boat. Robert Fulton is all set to take the boat on a test run. He looks at Dick and says, Well, step aboard, Dick. And in a second, everybody's aboard. And so begins for Dick. A never-to-be-forgotten voyage up the Hudson River in the year 1807. As they get underway, last picture top row, Dick walks around the strange-looking craft. It's powered by steam from a wood-burning boiler. Two big gears turn cumbersome side paddles which shower the deck with water. An elegant company of ladies and gentlemen are aboard. Robert Fulton proudly points first picture, second row at the most beautiful girl on the ship. And then he says to Dick, Dick, if all goes well and we reach New York again, Harriet Livingston promises to be my bride. Oh, gosh, I hope you make it. Last picture, second row, that night, the Clermont, for that's the name of the boat, Puffing fire and smoke reaches Albany, and half the voyage is done. First picture bottom row. Next morning, the return voyage gets underway. But almost immediately, trouble starts. In sight of the crowds lining both banks, the monster, as so many people call it, comes to a dead stop. Last picture, Robert Fulton's elegant passengers murmur, well, I told you so. Yes, it's a foolish scheme. Oh, I wish we were out of it. And Dick looks uneasily at Fulton, wondering what he's going to do. Oh, did the steamer break down? Well, something went out of commission. Isn't it terrible it had to happen when everybody's there to say, I told you so. Well, let's hope that Robert Fulton corrects what's wrong and gets the ship underway again. Do you think he We'll find that out next week. But now, look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And this I'm very anxious to read because you remember last week Tex came to the Dooley farm where Rusty was. Yes, he came there to buy a horse called Silver Lad for Mr. Miles. And was he surprised when he saw Rusty was here on the farm. Yes, and I hope now that Tex will take Rusty back to the Milestone farm because that's really Rusty's home. Well, let's see if he does. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Tex gives Rusty a big hug. Why, Rusty, you little maverick, am I glad to see you. Jeepers, Tex, that sure goes for me, too. Well, what in Sam Hill are you doing here? Well, well, you see, when Denver Dooley closed his carnival, he sent me here to look after his two horses. The detective who had found Silver Lad for Mr. Miles smiles. Well, I, I see I don't have to introduce you two. Oh, no, sir. Listen, mister. My boss, Mr. Miles, will be happier to get Rusty back than to get ten horses like Silver Lad. Yeah, but Tex, golly, I can't go back. Tex looks at Rusty in surprise. Last picture top row, Rusty exclaims, I guess you're forgetting I left Milestone Farm on account of my crook and Uncle Rufus looking for me there. No, I ain't forgetting, son. But that horned toad is a-setting in a nice Kentucky jail. 
and he won't be troubling anybody for some years. Oh, well, that's a relief. Then first picture bottom row, Rusty points the horses out to Tex. Oh, there are the horses, Tex. They were half starved when I first came, but they're beginning to look much better. Well, we'll have them in good shape in no time. And Mr. Miles wants to enter Silver Lead in the Lexington Junior League horseshoe. And then Tex turns to the detective. Oh, uh, Clinton, here's a certified check. You go to the bank and sew up the deal while Rusty and I get the horses in the van. Right, Mr. Purdy. I'll be back with the papers and sign an hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, at a small farm near Lexington, Kentucky, third picture bottom row, two men are talking. Well, boss, it looks like Quentin Miles beat us to that nag silver lead. I just got it by the grapevine that a private eye named Clinton found him. And Miles' trainer is going after him. Here, wait a second. Slow up. Where is the horse? How'd you find out? Last picture, the first man says, I know a cutie who runs a switchboard in Clinton's home office. She did a little listening in. It's a village in Pennsylvania called Honey Hollow. The man who seems to be the boss says, Hmm. Get a pansy roadmap. You and Porky got yourself a job. Oh, isn't it wonderful that Rusty's crooked uncle can't cause Rusty any more trouble? It certainly is. And now Rusty can go back to Milestone Farm again where he belongs. Yes, but it looks like those two men down there are planning something that looks like trouble to me. Yes, well, we'll find out about that next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. County Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.